Hi there, folks. My name is Jay Frost. And if you're new to this, this, of course, is the Philanthropy Mastermind Series brought to you by our friends at DonorSearch. In fact, there's their logo right there supplied by our presenter today. That was very kind of him. We won't be talking much about donor search unless he chooses to mention them for some reason, not because we don't love them. We do. But because the focus of this series, which is our free non-commercial series in this case of CR free accredited uh, sessions is all about you, your needs and interests and the things that drive you to do what you do every day for the missions that you support. And a donor search has been kindly providing a platform for these discussions going back to 2016. So if you're interested either in gra grabbing other credits towards your CFRE, if you're doing that, or just to learn more about what other people have to say about the things that are so important to us in fundraising and philanthropy, I hope you'll take a look for that over at donorsearch.net. It's again, donorsearch.net under the resources tab, where you'll see podcasts, webcasts, and CFRE accredited sessions like this one in that library. So that's all there for you. Plus, there will be a recording of this session posted there after today's session, probably in about four hours. So if there are people, colleagues of yours who you think would benefit from this content, I hope you'll direct them to it. Now, we do have a couple ways for you to engage with us in conversation today. But what I'm going to do uh, with permission of our presenter after I introduce him is to suggest that you utilize the chat now to say hello, not to issue any commercial messages. If you're out there trying to get people to sign up on your list, please save that for another day. But it, rather just to let us know that you're here, maybe which organization you're with, which city and state you're from. That would be a kind gesture so that our presenter knows that you're here. So thank you, Wendy. Teresa, others um, for saying hi. We really do appreciate that. Also, that's a great place to warm up to have conversation amongst yourselves. There may be content here which challenges you or you know causes you to have a certain idea or reaction. Feel free to use the chat for any of that and all of that throughout the presentation. We also have Q&A, questions and answers. You'll see that also uh, probably on the bottom of your screen. Please do post your questions there. It's a way we can ensure that we hear from you and we can build that into the Q&A at the conclusion of the presentation. So with that, I'm going to now give a short introduction to a person. Uh, if I gave him a proper introduction, it would take the entirety of our program. And that's Jim <laughs> Langley, uh, our friend in the field and a real leader who has been leading major campaigns for years. Um, you can read all about that, of course, over uh, at his site at langleyinnovations.com. That's langleyinnovations.com um, and learn all about his history. But those are several very large scale campaigns across the country before, of course, launching his own firm, Langley Innovations, which provides uh, a great deal of insight, not only to, into how we do things, but why. And uh, so we've had a conversation recently that I'll uh, share with you and you can see over on the donor search site which was really probing this is his chance to really give us some instruction so i'm going to be very quiet this and learn along with you as we do that um, you can also learn more from him from his books and i won't list all the titles here but once again direct you to his website so you can learn more about those purchase those and put them on your shelf so with that i want to step back and welcome once again our friend jim langley thanks so much jim for being here today Jay, thank you. I uh, really appreciate that kind introduction and thank everyone for being here. I know everyone is very busy. I appreciate your time and I will try very hard to make good use of it and uh, keep my eye on the chat box in the Q&A uh, to make sure I am responding to what you think is most important. Uh, for those of you who might know a bit about me, I do a lot of research uh, and most of what I recommend, of course, is based on research. I do my own and I also try to aggregate research from every credible source I can find. So when I work with you or I work with clients, I'm able to not just give opinions, but to be able to relay how the field is changing, particularly how the behaviors of donors are changing so that we meet them where they are and we don't get left behind as their behaviors change faster than some of our practices. And of course, that is happening. Years ago, I can't remember exactly when, I had done a lot of research and aggregated a lot of research and seen some of these trends coming. And I tried to capsulize it in the phrase of, we need to solicit less and elicit more. In other words, we need to do much more listening and much less soliciting. And when we solicit, it should be on the basis, basis of having elicited 
lots of points of view, lots of insights from donors, understanding their animating passions so that we come along as matchmakers, not as pitch artists. So I'm encouraged to see more and more research that's helping us understand the mindset of donors. This uh, done by Jen Shang and Adrian Sargent. I hope you know their work. Uh, they're well worth following and they publish quite frequently. Uh, Jen is the first person to have a PhD in philanthropy and is said to be the first philanthropic psychologist. I think that's something that we need is deeper insight into donor motivation, particularly as we are losing so many donors and seeing fewer and fewer giving households. So let, let's just parse this slowly if we could, because I think it's so important. They refer to a tectonic shift in philanthropic behavior. I don't think that's overstated. And what they're characterizing is a shift from a single focused fundraising act to a more complex mix of relationships that focus on shared values at work. There's so much in that phrase, isn't there? Moving from assumptive fundraising, of course you're interested in what we're doing. We're an important organization doing good work. You're a prospect. Now let us tell what's important. We're seeing a very different dynamic emerge. Tomorrow's philanthropy will thrive on creating partners and empowering philanthropists who are vested in both the processes and the outcomes of social change. So let's talk about how that works. It will nurture deeply held and sustainable connections between donors and beneficiaries, That's not just the organization, but donors and the recipients, the people who are served by the gifts given. So much there, so much to reflect on. So what I wanna do is to take that and to say, this is not possible to move in this direction, to achieve these ends, unless we get better at listening. That's not directed to you. I suspect everyone here um, is very astute, very good at what they do, and knows how important listening is when they are engaged in frontline fundraising. We need to talk about listening institutions and how we, with our knowledge of listening and the importance of listening, can help our institutions and our organizations lis listen much better. That will be critical. I always look at the convergence of knowledge. So anytime something's happening in the philanthropic world, I look in the, com <clears throat> in the commercial world and I say, are they learning the same lessons? Because they're studying consumer behavior all the time. This is a study or a, su a summar summary of a study done by Lippincott, big corporate branding firm. This is about a year ago, I think. Keep in mind, they have big budgets for market research. They do very sophisticated, very extensive market research to get the pulse of the consumer. Lots of dollars are riding on it and no branding firm is gonna be hired <clears throat> without good research that, that is then able to advise their clients about where the market is and how it can be intersected. So look what a powerful branding firm is saying to corporations and it sounds very much like what Jen Sheng and Adrian Sargent are trying to tell us about fundraisers and fundraising. First, we're in a human era. That's a phrase Lippincott is using. It, people want to help people. We're more suspicious of institutions. We don't trust organizations. We don't trust political systems. <clears throat> so we're looking at something more real and more authentic. We're looking for markers. We're looking for indications. When we look at organizations, we're saying as consumers, as donors, do I see myself and my purposes in them? And we're questioning some of their advertising and marketing and promotions. We're trying to look beyond and look for the real and the authentic. So Lippincott is advising its corporate clients the very same thing. Does this sound like a traditional corporation to you on the left? Doesn't to me, doesn't sound like corporations have behaved for much of their history but it's now a warning that they're be giving, being given that they have to be. Unfortunately, I think many nonprofits are still acting like corporations in their branding, in their communication. There's a kind of a self-importance to it. 
there's a kind of a, a I don't know, a slick look to it. And look, look what's happening as people are searching for something that's more real, authentic, and, and looking for people that they can identify with. And then on the right-hand side, the characteristics of the human error I highlighted demonstrate listening. <clears throat> so they talked about not only storytelling, we hear a lot about storytelling, but Lippincott says, your storytelling must demonstrate listening. In other words, we can't be telling stories about our virtues, about our good people, until we first listen to our current and prospective donors to know what they're searching for. And then we tell stories that resonate, that respond, that meet them where they are. That's much different uh, than what I think we've done in the main. Um, I say all these things, obviously, uh, to be um, to have fun in, in this dialogue, that we have this tendency to cook up ideas in splendid isolation and then spring them on the unsuspecting. And now we really have to listen and elicit before we interact with our constituents, even in our storytelling. Do we think it's a clever story? Do we think it's a compelling story? Or when we tell it, will our donors, current and prospective, go, ah, I see myself in that. They get me. I feel heard. I feel seen. This is so important to achieve. And then look at these other characteristics that a corporate branding firm is advising corporations to be mindful of. I would love if more nonprofits were mindful and adopted these virtues and these attitudes, we would all become much more effective at everything we do, <clears throat> including fundraising. All right, so now let's talk about how an entire organization from beginning to end can get better at listening so that when it comes time to fundraise, there's much greater receptivity. And the receptivity is you're speaking to their animating passions and you sound like them and they see themselves in what you are proposing. We, we, when we can talk about successes if you'd like, but when we hear from donors, when they see for themselves and see themselves in what we're proposing, they respond much better. So big winner during COVID were the food banks. When we went to donors who switched funding to food banks, it was eerie how many of them said, I could see the lines. I could see for myself. And then they said, and I could see that that could be me, my neighbors, my friends in those food lines. They could see for themselves and they could see themselves in that situation. That's an outcome we should strive for. So very often it starts with our strategic plan, but most strategic plans, if you will forgive me, are not strategic because they include such a weak external element. If we go back to the roots of strategy, we see it becomes the means by which the outside shapes internal aspirations. So we have traditionally done a strategic plan, then vetted it among a select few. And if we're gonna become a better listening organization and create more receptivity to fundraising, we must start with a needs assessment and then ask ourselves, or a series of needs assessment, and then ask ourselves, what are our capabilities to respond to it? You see, we don't cook it up in splendid isolation. We don't create a lot of internal committees unless and until we bring the outside in. We say, this is what the world wants. This is what the community wants. This is what our constituents want. Now let's plan to meet them where they are. Let's plan to deliver to them what is valuable, we'll be true to ourselves, but we must meet them where they are. So different than what has happened before, right? So key constituents must be a part of the creation of it. We should do research, we should do needs assessment, and we should do a lot of intake, a lot of town hall meetings, real or virtual, a lot of intake, then say, thank you so much. Um, now we're gonna go back and deliberate with representative bodies. So all of you that we've called upon will be represented in our strategic planning deliberations, and then we'll come forward uh, and again, vet it with you with what we've learned. So very different, more deliberate, but I submit to you that it will yield something far more strategic and something far more responsive 
and that many more people will see themselves in it as a result. If we're raising money for projects, let's make sure I didn't skip over it. projects. We'll talk about campaigns in a minute. If we're raising, so there's something that you want to raise money for. What we want to do is to bring people in as soon as possible before we ask them for money. So let me cite a cause that's near and dear to me, and that is the cause of veterans. I am one, that's an affinity that one feels across time and space. And let's say you take me as a test market donor or representative of lots of donors who would like to help veterans. Uh, what often happens is we get a pitch, we get a promotion, we get a call from someone saying we represent veterans, here's what we're doing, here are your options, how would you like to give? All right, so we may still give, but you may not optimize our potential, you may not awaken our animating passions, we may give out of obligation, we may give out of gratitude or sentiment, but you haven't brought our deeper being into the philanthropic equation. So that's a missed opportunity. So the worst option I wanna share with you then is as an example, we're just using veterans as an example, is asking funding from veterans in which veterans and veteran donors have had no say. We feel it, we sense it, don't hear a veteran voice. We hear someone maybe using clever words, but you know, any of us would know a veteran voice of any age when we hear it, we'd hear some grit We'd hear some learned reality that not everybody learns, you know, but isn't it funny that outreach is not from a veteran or it's not a veteran's voice. It's not the struggling veteran. It's not um, the veteran who might have PTSD. It's not the, it's not the um, veteran who lost his friend to suicide, his, his colleague to suicide. It's, it, it doesn't sound real. It sounds made up. So even better before you go and ask a veteran is to preview a draft of that plan. What is the what is the initiative by which you hope to help more veterans? Either do better by the same number of veterans or help a larger amount. Run that plan by veterans so that when you go out to ask people for it, you can say, we vetted it with veterans. Veterans told us this is important. This is why we're emphasizing that. So that's better, even better would have been to survey veterans and veteran donors at the outset. That's what I mean by the needs assessment. What are the most important things to accomplish for veterans today? Um, what are you hearing from veterans in your life? What causes you the most concern? And, and what do you think we should do about it? And you see, we have a voice in it. Then you play back. So when we hear what you're proposing to do, ah, I, I hear myself in it, and I can cite examples when we've done surveys where people have actually come up to organizations I represented and they say, you know, I said that I was the one who offered that. Uh, it was a thousand people who said the same thing, but we were thrilled that that single person thought he or she had been heard because of the survey and the intake that we had been done. And then even better, and where we need to get, is to involve those veterans right from the outset convene a group of current uh, veterans, young veterans, have them sit down with recent veterans, talk about uh, what they're struggling with, and then work with whoever your head of veterans affairs is or your organization, then to create the initiative. And when we create co-ownership, um, funding flows naturally. So I think one of the great misnomers of all time is time, talent, and treasure. I believe it's actually talent, time, treasure, or experience, time, treasure. If we first capture experience or talent and put it to good use, we then give more time. Oh, I'm having a difference. Somebody listens to me. I can help others. And the more I feel my experience or my talent is valued, the more time I give you. And the more time I give you and the more sweat equity I give you, the more invested I am in the end product. And so when the end product is invested and presented to me, you may not even have to ask, I'm already on board. How do we get to that better place? I'm gonna just take a quick, <clears throat> yes, the slide deck will be available. Thank you for asking. And I'll also give you contact information at the end. And if there's anything else you hear me mention uh, that would be helpful to you, I would be happy to 
pass that on to you so you have some um, information and tools at your disposal, all right? So then I try to characterize and capture this then in a kind of a before and after. Um, as a teacher, I want to contrast the old way with a new way. And I quite frankly see a lot of organizations stuck in the old way, which is characterized, I characterize as a weak fundraising posture given current realities. Crying for need, asking for gifts, et cetera, et cetera. There's still a lot of that going on and there's a lot of that going on in the nonprofit world. Not just the people we're trying to help, but poor us, the organization. Um, I understand that, I can empathize with that, but as a fundraising strategist, I have to tell you that's not the best way. And then look at what we know and can tell from a body of experience ongoing, what's working better and better, impact scenarios, not chasing gifts, proposing partnerships. You see, you have to listen. You can pitch a gift idea to somebody, but to create a partnership, it takes time. You have to explore what we share. You have to talk about how we might deliver institutional agency. So this weak versus strong parallel is what I use as a teaching tool, whether I'm facilitating board uh, retreats or working with CEOs or working with heads of advancement to sort of say, can we evaluate where you are and are you capturing these new realities? Are you stuck in a kind of a pathetic place uh, as opposed to um, we intend to make a difference together? Uh, which is far more powerful, as you can imagine. All right. So campaigns. I have a lot of uh, experience with those, as Jay mentioned, and I still help clients with those, but I recommend something very different than what we've seen before. I think, again, keep in mind that most campaigns, the reasons for them, the rationale for them was largely cooked up in splendid isolation and then sprung on the unsuspecting. You go, well, Jim, maybe that's a bit too harsh because we do have these things called feasibility studies. Well, how many feasibility studies have I done? I can't tell you how many, and I continue to do. There's rarely a week that goes by where I'm not interviewing some high net worth philanthropist. But who do you ask me to talk to? Insiders, your most powerful donors, the ones who are most likely to give. I understand, I'm not quarreling with you about that, but you see, they're already in your camp, by and large. They're already believing in you. So we're testing an idea about the direction you're setting and the money you need with the people most likely to give to it, which is not the same to test it with people who you want to bring on board, who you want to turn to in the public phase of a, of a campaign, who you hope will come off the fence, who will you hope will come in your direction. You see, they never got involved in the planning process. They're usually not involved in feasibility studies. They're usually not surveyed in advance of campaigns. And you hope that your presentation, your pitch, your frontline development staff is so adept, so charismatic that they click with donors, that there's instant receptivity, that immediately the donor says, I see myself and your purposes, and I can see why you're doing what you're doing. I've been at it a long time. I thought it was pretty good. Uh, time and experience humbled me a lot. I had much less to do with donor decisions than I thought. Uh, at my best, I was listening and bringing to them what they hoped to find. We rely too much on hoped for receptivity instant receptivity based on charisma, based on magic, which is largely mythical, as opposed to building receptivity, how? By listening, right? So these are the campaign realities. This is what is really happening. And so if you want to go into a campaign and be successful, you've got to do more of what we've described in earlier slides, in earlier moments. There is no public waiting for you. And this is a hard cold <clears throat> reality. <clears throat> that many, excuse me, <clears throat> that many organizations <clears throat> realize when they go into the public phase. And we're seeing less and less bedrock institutional support, people who say, you are a proxy for my values. And we see more and more donors 
not just giving to an organization because they believe in it, but through it, because they think some part of it <clears throat> will have an impact in an area they care about. I'm trying not to aggravate this thing in my throat, but excuse me. So <clears throat> we must have much more forethought, much more listening. And the campaign must focus on endorsed outcomes. You see what I'm saying? Get people to buy into the precepts in the conceptual stage of a campaign before you roll out the formal campaign itself. The more we elicit before the campaign, the more effective we will be <clears throat> in soliciting. Let's take frontline fundraising. I mentioned earlier that I do a lot of board facilitations and very often <laughs> vice presidents of advancement bring me in to help educate boards about the realities of fundraising. And it's rare to, to not hear a board member say, well, you know, one of the things we need is a better elevator pitch. And I have to say, um, I understand what you're saying, but I think what you really need is a better elevator interview because you're not pitching at first meeting. You're listening. And from that listening, you are trying to find an alignment of purpose. So what you need is an elevator pitch. And we go, well, what does he mean by that? So the best thing to discover about a prospect, whether you know them or not, as soon as you can, in whatever way you can, using whatever words you can, is to which cause do they give the most? And why? Because philanthropy is biography. The cause or purpose to we give to which we give the most is most revealing of our story, our biography, our purposes, our hopes. And so when we know to which cause or purpose someone has given and why, I give a lot to veterans because I was a veteran. I give a lot to food banks because I went through hunger at one period in my life. Whatever it is, you find the more generous people are within their means, the more personal that issue is to them. A wonderful story if I could share with you very quickly. I'll keep my eye on the time to make sure we allow for Q&A is my colleague, uh, Pete Frisco, gave me a wonderful anecdote about raising money for a library when he was at Drexel. And they discovered there was a woman in Philadelphia that gave to libraries routinely. She hadn't given to Drexel before, so they knew there was a match. They got her to give to Drexel. Sure enough, she came through with one of the lead gifts. And it was only after that he thought to ask, it's so wonderful what you're doing for libraries. Uh, why? Why are you so fond of libraries? And she told him a story about being abused by her first husband, and the libraries were a safe haven for her and her children. No one threw them out. It was a wonderfully quiet atmosphere. There were good books for the children to read. So it was this incredibly important haven for them that allowed them to be as a family and to do loving, constructive things together. And so she never forgot the sanctuary that libraries provided her. So Pete goes, can I tell you about what we're doing in the policy side, dealing with abused women? Can I tell you some of the other things? Of course, she lights up right away and gives, I don't know, a year or two later, the largest gift she's ever given anywhere. So we got it pegged as an Ella, um, as a as a as a <clears throat> library contributor. Nobody asked her why. So what we want to do with every single donor, train our boards, train our volunteers, train our staff, get that into the record. To which cause or purpose do you give the most and why? Take time to get that backstory, that biography, get that in your records and make sure you never compete with their favorite cause, you do everything you can do to compliment it, right? Oh, if you care about at-risk teenagers, did you know this is what we're doing with at-risk or for or could be applicable to at-risk teenagers, right? So frontline fundraising, get spend the time to get to that issue. And you don't qualify someone, in my humble opinion, as an institutional donor. You define the corridor in which they will come in and self-actualize, like the woman was giving to libraries, but really self-actualized around helping other abused women. 
we have discovered in this listening mode, working across a large number of clients, that a draft white paper of about four pages, that's it is, it's marked draft, there's nothing fancy about it, I call it low gloss, high content, is one of the best conversation starters with current prospects and new prospects. Why? You haven't gotten all figured out, it's marked draft, and you're coming in and saying, ah, you know, given what we learned in our earlier conversations, and knowing you care deeply about this issue, here's something on the drawing board before we get too far down the pike. Would you take a look at this and let us know we're, if we're on the right track? See what? See how different that is? You're eliciting well, well before you solicit. And the more times, the more time you have between your elicitations and your solicitations, the volume and the time, the more the solicitation happens and unfolds naturally. And many people who have worked with us on this process say, it's amazing, Jim, how often people at some point just say, how can I help? They obviate, they make the solicitation not necessary. We still argue that there might still need to be a formal solicitation for the sake of protocol, for the sake of a, a, a ritual, uh, so that the donor knows how important it is, right? So we're learning so much as we move more into more patient, deliberate listening modes um, and customizing a engagement. We're learning that the turning point in what we used to call cultivation, and I really like to call it customized engagement, is when you can get someone to see for themselves what you're doing. You get them to come in and see for themselves. So I characterize that as show, don't tell. You create circumstances where they come in and see for themselves. I've told an anecdote many times over. I'll tell it quickly about one gentleman who gave um, to, to um, oceanography, oceanography to improve the health of oceans because they just asked him to go out on a dive with a pod of scientists. And the scientists did an assay of coral reefs going from the most beautiful and healthy to the most degraded. And he said, by the time he got to the top, he knew what he had to do and who he wanted to work with. Show, don't tell. Food banks, I could see the lines. So how was use fewer words and put more images or get people in to see what you see so that you know it's more important. You see, that's a way of listening getting them in environments, then listening to how they respond to their heart, to their soul, all right? And create experiences that money can't buy. So much of what we've done in the name of fundraising has not been beautiful conversation, has not been soulful. It's things like, don't get me wrong, don't throw anything at me. We do golf tournaments. I love golf. Uh, we do galas. I'm not so crazy about galas. Some of you may like galas, but you see those are entertainments. That's not bringing people into the pith and the substance of the place, to the grit of what you're doing. It's not allowing them to see. Remember the Lippincott, let me see you as you are. Let me see you for your struggles. Let me see the challenges you face. Stop shining me on and acting like everything is great. I'm a human being. I am a rational um, thinker. Sit down with me and tell me the truth and talk about how we might work together. And then ultimately, we want this to come together in a written gift agreement that includes the donor role in the gift going forward. Quick example, uh, a couple that, that gives a gift so that a group of theater students at a college can go see a Broadway play every year. What they did that was so smart was to ask the couple to host it, actually take the group of students with them, um, conduct the tour themselves. Of course, the couple was thrilled not just to give the money to, but continue to interact with those theater students who they saw as the future of something they cared about. Annual giving, tougher, but we still got to think that same way. How do we elicit before we solicit? Well, start talking to current annual donors about what their most joyous experience was, what they noticed about your organization, who maybe in your organization they admire. And what you're going to see is... <clears throat> is while they all care about your organizations, is that they came to it, into it, through different doors, corridors, or portals. Different messages trigger different responses in different people. So what we've got to do is listen and find the multiple ways that people have seen themselves in our organization and then present them back. 
so much of annual giving options are kind of monolithic or, oh, it's that time of year again. It's giving day, da ding, da ding. It's end of year. I've seen no end of announcements. It's end of year, time to remember us. Uh, and we wonder why end of year giving is getting soft. Uh, we wonder why as uh, happy as we are about giving days, we're seeing higher rates of attrition than ever before at a time when we're losing donors at a rate than ever before. You see, it's not satisfying. Why isn't it satisfying? We haven't listened. Any way you can listen, polling, surveying, interpersonal surveys, and, and if you don't have the person power to do it, get volunteers. I can't tell you how many boards and advisory boards I'm asking to help conduct interviews and how many are willing to do it. Not every single person on every board, but lots of board members going, oh yeah, I can give you two hours um, a month. I can give you two hours a week, some say. Tell me who to interview, what to say. We've got to provide toolkits. We've got to do this in a scientific way. Give them templates, give them a way to record that information, send it in. This is true of everything I'm saying. This listening has to be structured. Remember the study that was done that said the single greatest virtue a fundraiser can have is curiosity. It's called, they call them curious chameleons. They can, they must be curious and they must be adaptive to the language being used, the mindset being used by donors, that that was the best fundraiser and there are so few of them. But then we have to take natural curiosity and harness it by what I call forensic listening a structured interview template, a, a way then for that person to quickly complete the survey, push a button and send it back so that you can continue to listen and learn. Estate giving. In, in my era, there was so much about, again, forgive me, nothing against, but we need to hire lawyers because the instruments are so sophisticated. What we learned by listening, by studying the field was, at least 90% of people continue to give using the simple will. Very few people are using complex instruments. So we went around for a long time selling instruments. Oh, well, if you got one of those, one of those cruts, uh, I wasn't gonna give before, but now that you're offering cruts and you got a 4% a uh, payout, well, maybe I'll, you see where I'm going? As opposed to saying late in life giving is a culmination of values and purposes, and when done well and done beautifully, it's an attempt to pass on life's most valuable lessons to current and coming generations. So the most effective approach, most effective approach, by far and away, and I've learned this from my wonderful um, GP, PG uh, colleagues, is you take them through an autobiographical exercise. You take the time to say, just tell me what you learned. Why did you make that first gift? What animated your philanthropy throughout your life? What, what are the most important lessons? What would you like your children, your grandchildren to know, or the equivalents, whether you have them or not? What would you like those generations to know? And the more time you take, the more we learn, the wiser we get, the more beautiful and enjoyable this career becomes. The great compliment of my career is not being a party to raising, I don't know, three and a half, four billion dollars. It's being asked multiple times to give eulogies at donors' funerals. Learn the art of the slow, patient, deeply curious interview or find people who do it. Journalists, social scientists, forget the fundraising, sit people down, and in that deep, soulful interview, ask probing questions, not about their response to the institution, but what gets them up in the morning, what they think remains to be done with the rest of their life, what, what they were most proud of, what did they regret, et cetera, et cetera. Take the time. And I would hope that some of you, if you had the means, would think about doing these as oral histories recording them or videotaping them. I think what you'll find is you have powerful material that has all kinds of value. As you bring new board members on, you may wanna take snippets from those to say, you see, this is what this organization has meant to people. 
over time. You may want to take new fundraisers and orient them to say, you see, see where I'm going? You, you may have historical value in those testimonies in and of themselves, but you, you repurpose that, you take excerpts from that, and you take that human testimony as evidence of human impact over time, and you play that back. And when you get frustrated or depressed, you play excerpts of that and say, ah, uh, that's why we're here. You play that at staff meetings. That's why we're here. When things get crazy inside, when you get insane expectations parked on your shoulder, go back to those voices. Uh, that's why we're here. Isn't that what makes all our careers so rewarding? Stewardship. <clears throat> I'm recommending, I'm seeing more and more acceptance. We must institute an annual stewardship interview for our most significant donors, because we have to be practical, it should be interpersonal. They should be getting a call or an email saying, time for your annual stewardship interview. And in that annual stewardship interview, we, we should be saying, how are we doing? Not just the advancement office, not the stewardship office. How is the whole organization doing? What advice would you give the president or CEO? When have you been most proud of us? When have you sort of wondered like, what on earth are those people doing? You ask really non-defensive, open-ended questions in that annual stewardship interview. You see what that does is to make people feel not just like a donor who's given conditional love for giving, but a stakeholder whose point of view is valued not just by the advancement operation, but by the senior administration and the board. And then we need the board to start echoing what they hear. Believe me, I'm giving that message to boards as well. You need to hear the voices coming through your organization, you need to listen to them and you need to play back. We heard you, we kind of screwed up there. We could have done this better. We sounded a little impersonal there. We heard you, you see, but we've got to lift up the information. We've got to create the channels inside so that this is possible. If you can't conduct um, an interpersonal interview, if you can't get volunteers, if you can't get, I don't know, anybody to do it, um, other people in your organization who aren't in fundraising or advancement, be creative, uh, then conduct polls and surveys uh, that you, every year and ask these big non-defensive questions. And watch, even when people say, I don't have the time or don't need to, you're going to generate positive word of mouth. Do you know what they're doing? What I've noticed particularly about um, significant donors, wealthy, I don't mean all donors are significant, but let's talk about wealthy donors, is they compare notes among themselves and they sort of share which organizations are impressing them more than others. Maybe it happens with all donors. I just have been privy to donors in certain social settings talking about which organizations do it well, all right? So there's so many ways that we can start listening. I'm gonna check my um, questions here again. Do you have a standard set of questions you ask when eliciting? Yes, um, you know, maybe that, obviously that's what I do for a living. So maybe I can give some examples or samples of that, but I can't turn over all the all the work that we're doing. But yes, I'll, I'll try to give um, some some samples. Maybe um, either can contact me or I'll send something to um, Jay. <laughs> now, um, in nowhere is loyalty is listening more important than loyalty, um, and we've gotten a lot of boards now to do to bring in loyal donors. Most loyal donors buy years of giving, not amounts given panel discussions in which the board chair or the president interviews loyal donors with the board watching. Oh, does that ever cause them to realize fundraising is a long game, not about what you did last quarter or last year. When these loyal donors say why they gave, why they, what, and many of them are either have given an estate gift or are planning a gift, this is a very wonderful way to show don't tell board members the long, powerful rhythms of fundraising, that when we attend to relationships, not just dollars, the orchard bears fruit over time. If we just pull the low-hanging fruit from it and don't attend to the orchard, the trees wither and die, and we haven't replaced them, right? So this is a great way to start educating boards to these larger realities. 
All right, so here's a kind of a quick summary, again, because I knew you, some of you would want the slides, and I wanted to sort of summarize. So we need, what I'm talking about is going from one-way communication to two-way, interactive, dialogic, from single channel, promotion. Here's what you need to know. Here's our charismatic representative. Here's our president talking on and on and on about the wonderful things we do to make it dialogic because all the research says dialogic will lead to greater um, affinity, receptivity, feeling valued, feeling heard, et cetera, et cetera, all the things that we know. So take all the resources that you poured into one-way communication and think about how to make them two-way. Great, great topic for a staff meeting, great topic for a staff retreat. How do we take all these one-way channels, including websites, and turn them into two-way, including every meeting with donor? What are five questions that all of us can ask every time we meet with a donor so we don't take anything for granted? We peel another way, another layer, and we get to their animating passions, what wakes them up in the morning. So we meet them, we come alongside them in that journey to self-actualization, not just sort of waver, have you thought about us? We come alongside, oh, this organization gets me. I see what they're trying to do. I see myself in what they're proposing. How do we do that? Great topic for retreat. Um, this is, uh, again, some material I will put on LinkedIn because I test market everything I do on LinkedIn to see if my colleagues across the world, advancement practitioners, see the same thing. And when I get in strong affirmation, I share them at every opportunity. So this is what we're recommending to give you some concrete objectives for 2023. Stop, start. I won't read them all to you, but I'll give you a chance to look at them. And I'm going to open up the floor here in just a moment for questions. And I continue to keep my mind, um, uh, my eye on the chat box and on the Q&A. Make sense? See where I'm going? Again, trying to contrast the old instructive, assumptive way, uh, almost a kind of a corporate model of, you know, we promote, we advertise, we market. Uh, we assume you're a loyal customer to, we're not sure. We may have lost some customers. We better get a little bit more humble, a little bit more listening, a little bit more responsive. These are simple steps that we can take that move a culture in the right direction. It's not just about what we do in front, frontline fundraising. This may be a little radical, but if I'm not able to fill frontline fundraising positions, I'm going to hire more stewardship officers, and I'm going to posit that you're going to raise more money by listening than you are by traditional frontline fundraising methods. If you can't hire people, the market's telling you something, they don't like the job, they don't like the job description, they got better options, you can hire listeners, journalists, social scientists, people who wouldn't be interested in fundraising. We'll listen for you. Put them in stewardship. There's no downside to long-term intensive listening. People are always complimented. Some of you know about my, my breakthrough experience at Georgetown in putting students in the field to listen to lapsed alumni donors and how transformative that was for everyone involved. But here, if we're going to make adjustments, if you want some concrete suggestions, here are ways we move from the old style, the assumptive style, to the adaptive style, from the pitch to the receive. One of the put downs I remember hearing way back when I was in the army was somebody was all send and no receive. I think a lot of institutions are guilty of all send, no receive. All right, so you get the slides, you can mull over them. Um, Jay will give you my contact information. I'm opening up the Q&A here and keep, uh, uh, keep them coming. Um, <clears throat> Can you explain nesting overhead? Yes. So what I think is a terrible mistake is institutions going out there in, in various venues and saying, we need overhead. We can't. You simply take the good that you're doing, you present the greater good that you can do, and you just build in the cost of doing business. I don't know how it was that we decided to separate overhead and put it on the market 
when it's the least interesting thing we could do. I have, I have tested this over and over again. You take a gift concept, a powerful gift concept to a major donor, and this is where you're going to get most of your traditional overhead taken is you say, we're going to, you know, we're going to, we served uh, 800 at risk teenagers last year with a million five. We think we can get it up to a thousand. Here's the reason we can believe it. That's why we're asking you for a million five. Uh, the, the cost of doing business, the overhead is simply built into the budget and you do present budgets when you get <clears throat> to high end items. Putting overhead out there and saying we need overhead is simply taking the um, disaggregating mission from cost. When the donor wants to invest in outcomes, not subsidize. The market is moving away from subsidization of institutions to selective investment in what they believe is the healthiest part. You put out overhead and it looks like the enterprise is wobbling and the modern philanthropic investor goes, I'm not gonna pour money into a wobbly enterprise. If it's functional, if it's got a strong platform and then a man being asked to give, everything is value added. I hope that makes sense. Uh, what are some tips in getting your board more engaged? I believe it's in the board programming. As I said, bringing donors in asking them either as a social event before the board meeting or at the board meeting to say, hey, how about a panelist of five most uh, loyal donors by years of giving? Because it's the right thing to do. These folks have been good by us through thick and thin. And it's the smart thing to do because they're very likely estate donors. The board member goes, okay, go. You bring them in and then watch that what happens. Remember, it's about people helping people. It's not about fundraising strategy. So the key is to let board members see for themselves and see themselves in it. When you put the, remember um, Shang and, and Sargent's advice is they want to see the beneficiaries. So bring donors in and bring the people who have been impacted by your service into the board and watch what happens by spontaneously as they respond more at a human level, okay? Um, Let's see. Do you have examples? Of, I'll give uh, somebody, uh, but I've also posted on LinkedIn if this is appealing to you, if you find this helpful. One of the things I do is post regularly and actively on LinkedIn. And what animates me is if we find the best way. I want to help good causes who can't afford consultants like me. So I try to transfer that knowledge by putting it out on LinkedIn and again, test marketing it. So I have send me, um, Jay will give you my contact information, but I'll send you a kind of the things that I have around uh, good questions to ask and stewardship interviews and other things that, that I've aggregated. I've, I've put it together in a single document. Um, it may have another organization's name in it. So forgive me if I don't have time to customize it, but I'll, I'll give you whatever I can that will be helpful to you. Uh, so glad you're so interested in the questions. That's very encouraging to me. That's really where it is. And that's where we take the natural curiosity of good fundraisers and start harnessing it by science, what I call forensic interviews, and then start recording it in our record systems in a more systematic way. So much of our records are based on subject, subjective reports from a variety of people. We need to get everybody who's gathering information about donors to operate less subject subjectively to use the same templates so that you enter information that is more consistent, therefore more useful, more predictive. Hope that also makes sense. Okay, don't see anything else. I know we've just got a few minutes. Anybody, Jay, anything I missed? I think you're covering it, although people are going wild just thanking you for, for this session, Jim. And, and I wanna give you my personal thanks as well. Uh, you know that you're uh, you're you're preaching from my my scripture on this, and I, I'm so Our grateful. Kindred spirits. Um, and I did enclose in the chat uh, the um, information about both uh, how people can reach you, um, how people can follow you on LinkedIn, which is a place where I continually learn from you. Um, if you're not familiar with what Jim is posting there, I really would strongly encourage you to follow him. 
because he will uh, put up these grids very frequently or lists or charts that are as much um, as sharing information as they are, uh, a, a, you know, um, a way to catalyze conversation uh, amongst us on these issues. So the conversation underneath those posts are, are really instructive and, and very fun. Um, so you'll see all that once again in the chat. If you missed any of it, I'll post all of it again in just a moment in a big blob. So I hope you go ahead, click those links, and then revisit them later. You'll also see there a link to the conversation I had with him live at Strathmore, one of the many places he's worked with over the years. Beautiful hall uh, in Maryland, where we had a really probing conversation about leadership and what it takes to bring that kind of stable, present, thoughtful, um, mindful leadership that um, in many ways he's been describing in this process that he's been talking about today. So I hope you'll take a look at that. And you'll also see uh, here a link to his website so you can learn more about the work that he does through uh, he and his colleagues at Langley Innovations. Finally, um, if you're interested in content like this, uh, you'll see a link to a session that I'm doing that's live in New York this week on a different topic, but I think maybe of interest to you. So I hope you'll click that, take a look and join us at least virtually when I'm sitting in New York talking with Brandon Parks. I'm gonna go back here, Jim, and just see if there's anything that's come up. I don't think so. Um, so it looks like you've really given us the lots to chew on and people are loving it. So again, thank you so much for, for taking time to share this with us today. Uh, really appreciate you. My pleasure. My, my affection and regard to everybody who's listening. I know what you do for a living. We're kindred spirits. I know it's not easy. Let's stick together and we'll find better ways. And with that, I would want to thank everybody for joining us. I hope you'll join us for many more of these sessions throughout the year. You'll find more about them over at DonorSearch.net. You'll see that in some of the links. Uh, and while you're there, if you're interested in your donors, and I don't know why you would have been in the session if you weren't, <laughs> you can learn more about your donors at DonorSearch as well. They are very uh, interested in knowing more about them so we can be thoughtful stewards of their interests by knowing more about where they come from and what they care about. Um, so you'll learn all about that at DonorSearch.net. But with that, I want to thank you again. Thank uh, uh, this wonderful man, Jim Langley, for all he does for us in the field, as well as sharing his time today, and encourage all of you to come back and join us on Thursday for the next program. Till then, please take care, stay safe, uh, stay healthy. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jay.